have a few folks who are um, coming into the um, to the session, but we want to go ahead and get started and uh, be timely in our presentation of uh, this exciting topic today of microsites. Um, I'm Brenda Harms. Thank you so much for joining us and for joining Converge Consulting for this webinar. The idea behind this webinar actually came out of some need that we were seeing from many of our clients who were in one of two places. Um, and I'm guessing many of you that are on the phone with me are in a similar situation. Either number one, you have a microsite that's audience specific and you are wondering what needs to be done, what tweaks and modifications you might need to make to that. Or number two, you're in the position of trying to make a decision as to whether or not you need to have an audience specific microsite for your uh, specific group that you are either trying to recruit or trying to engage in conversation with your, um, um, with your constituents. So that was really the idea behind this microsite webinar and conversation. And I have committed myself this time around, if any of you have listened uh, in on webinars that I have presented before, the uh, number one concern that our guests always express is that I share too much content and don't leave enough time for questions. So I have taken the feedback to heart and I have been very, very intentional to cut back on the amount of content that I'm going to share and really allow time at the end to have some conversation around questions. Uh, Becky Vardaman, Senior Digital Strategist with Converge, is also joining me on the phone and will be available uh, to answer questions if they slip towards the technical end of things. But we are both looking forward, um, hopefully, to a lively discussion and lively interaction today around the topic of microsites. So welcome. Um, thank you for joining us. I think most people are getting into the webinar now, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. With the questions, folks, as you do have questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box. Becky will be receiving those, and then we are going to hold them to the end because we do know we have time at the end for question and conversation. So uh, please feel free to type in a question as you have one, and then uh, by all means we will cover those towards the end of the webinar. Um, one second. There we go, advancing my slide. Um, a quick word about Converge Consulting before we dive into the content. Um, Converge is really a higher education marketing firm that really focuses heavily on digital marketing, but also focuses on what's next in relationship to marketing towards recruitment. And that's a big piece of our webinar today, as I believe microsites are both a marketing tool as well as a recruitment tool. And we're going to spend a few minutes talking about that um, a little bit further on in the in the conversation. I have my list of the items that we're going to schedule to cover today, but as I said before, very open to needing to add um, and address anything that you might have as it comes up in relationship to conversation. So when we think about microsites, um, obviously one of the big benefits to microsites is the clear and concise user path and really being able to get your user to the information that they're looking for very, very quickly. Um, also, obviously, that ability to develop very specific content for a specific user. One of the things, and we'll talk about this more, but one of the hard things about working in higher ed is that your website serves a lot of audiences. And even though we all try to prioritize who's the most important audience for your website, um, we all know that it's still um, one of those tools that serves a lot of masters. And so there's often a lot of competition for uh, real estate in relationship to the website. I also know just based on our typical customer base that we probably have a lot of folks who've dialed in that are um, serving folks on the adult and graduate side of the shop. And so we're going to do some specific um, or share some specific thoughts around that content as well. There are also a lot of advantages to search engine optimization with microsites. We're going to get into a few more details uh, with that within the context of the webinar. Uh, maximizing online real estate we talked about. I also am a have become a bigger and bigger fan of microsites because, quite frankly, you can actually get them done. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about an average timeline for redesigning an institutional website and how that parallels um, designing and, and executing a microsite, and it's obviously dramatically faster. And then, of course, your institutional need. Um, towards the end, we're going to have a little bit of conversation about uh, ways that you might assess or ways that you might have some assessment done to see if you're an institution for whom it really makes sense to have a microsite moving forward. A couple of, I guess, what I'm going to call kind of foundational givens 
before we uh, dive in here to the rest of the content. At Converge, we really view the web as the hub of your marketing strategy, and really all things reach out from that. This has been, if, if you've been around higher ed for 25 years, 30 years, 35 years, this has really been a shift. And I would say it's actually probably not until just really the last 10 years that most institutions have finally stopped thinking of websites as a library or a place to host a whole lot of information and really started considering them more of a marketing tool and, and really functioning, uh, developing the functionality of their marketing strategy around their website as their main marketing tool. We know that the messages that, that you put out on the website um, really have the opportunity to look at your points of distinction. We know that it looks at the benefits of whether it's your academic program or your institution as a whole. But the other thing that a good marketing website does is it lets your audience know that you understand them and their lives. And that's one of the things that we see as being so critical with our adult and graduate market specifically. We know that one of the big pushes in all marketing is to get people to the website and drive people to the website website and bring in traffic. And, and we hear a lot from the marketing folks that we work with that that's the goal, drive traffic to the website. I want to challenge that thinking a little bit today to say that driving traffic to the website is simply not enough. Um, the traffic you're driving to the website may be my father, who is, you know, 73 and certainly not a prospective uh, student, um, probably not even a prospective donor. <laughs> Traffic as a whole is a very broad um, type of language that is extraordinarily unqualified in relationship to the type and, and really the strategic effort that you might be putting around some of that individual um, traffic that you might want to drive. When we think about bringing prospective student audiences to our website, it's nice when they come to our site, but the real goal um, it's kind of the golden nugget, if you will, is that they engage with our website, that they take an action, that they complete a goal that we have very intentionally set up for them, hoping that they will move to completion of that goal. It's the engagement with our website that I think we are most after and really what, what begins to set the stage or, or I guess set the bar for what you should look towards when you think about microsites. I also want to challenge that web is not only a primary marketing tool, but it's also a primary recruitment tool. Many of you have heard me say over the years that marketing and recruitment should have really a hand-holding relationship, that um, while they might not quite be engaged, they should at least be dating pretty aggressively. Marketing and recruitment really do need to function very, very closely um, at your institution. The disconnect I think that we sometimes see is what the long-term goal is. And whereas marketing's goal is that high level aware, marketing invites the conversation, recruitment is the one who closes the deal. And the closer those two can operate together, I think the more effective your microsite has the opportunity to be. Web is really, for all intent and purposes, the one place where at 11 o'clock at night when you have an adult student or a graduate student specifically who's on your website and looking around, it's your website that's recruiting them at that point. It's the content, it's the goals, it's the engagement that exists around that microsite or that portion of the website that's really going to be the thing to recruit them in. Um, a lot of information is available out there on the web for our adults and graduate students, even though they are very savvy at taking a look and shopping for themselves. Good engagement on a microsite, uh, good engagement on the web is where you really have that opportunity to begin the conversation towards recruitment. Microsites, I think, have just a little bit more ability to do that as they're a tighter tool uh, for this specific audience. I want to ask you to think about for a minute as you sit in the room where you are at, who your primary audience is. Who are you most interested in engaging with? Um, we may have some advancement folks on the webinar who are thinking donors, alumni. Um, we may have some traditional undergraduate folks on the line who are thinking, okay, I'm thinking about engaging with that 16 and 17 year old. We may, I would assume, also have a number of adult and graduate focused um, individuals on, on the webinar today as well. When you think of that primary audience, you have to understand that unless um, your institution truly only serves one master, <laughs> you are one of many audiences that that website is serving. And so when you think about your primary .edu site, 
your brendaharmsuniversity.edu site, it is serving a lot of different audiences. At a minimum, traditional undergraduate, graduate, adult, if you're serving an adult population. But we also know those are external audiences. Alumni fall into that bucket. Donors fall into that bucket. Community members. Um, a lot of schools are utilizing a lot of community engagement. They fall into that bucket. And then we can't forget, and, and certainly they won't let us forget, that faculty and staff are also heavily served by that website and our current student body. So I'm thinking of well over half a dozen audiences that that one institutional website is trying to serve. And consequently, again, for those of us who have done this for a while, we know when we're trying to um, be all things to a wide number of people, what we end up doing is falling short in a number of categories. And again, hence one of the reasons for a microsite. If you think of a microsite as being a subset of your primary institutional site that's designed with a single specific user in mind, I think that's the best way to think about microsites. Um, microsites have been kicked around in the higher ed space for a very long time, trying to figure out, you know, is this needed, is this not needed? Athletics, quite honestly, has really um, been out in front on developing um, their own microsites. Um, and they led the way for a while, but I'm not sure exactly that many of us understood why they led the way. And, and in the case of athletics, for example, one of the things that we know happens is there are many people who follow athletic teams um, at colleges or universities that, quite honestly, don't care that much about anything else going on at the institution. They're only interested in the athletics. Very similar thinking in relationship to developing a microsite for any specific audience that you have. If I'm a 35-year-old mom who has a full-time job and three little kids at home, when I think about going back to school, if you think broadly of all the information that's on the website and then you think about what little subset of that information really matters to me as that 35-year-old working mom, it's probably less than 5% of all the stuff that's on your website. So when we think about utilizing a microsite, we think of that specific user in mind with the content, with the images, and the design with the messaging that's there and how, how wording is positioned, all of the information that's there, what's there, as well as what's not there. Think of what you could leave out for that working mom, rather, you know, in comparison to what needs to be included for that 16-year-old. We also know that the goals around the microsite can be very, very user-specific when you have a single key audience. Everything within the context of a microsite can be user-specific. So there's really not any ancillary stuff that a consumer would need to sort through in order to get at the information that they were most interested in. Um, again, if you know me well, you know that I'm a huge fan of analogies, and I couldn't resist the little shoe analogy, shoe trapping analogy, um, within the context of thinking about microsites. If I am the woman who wears these shoes, I am more than likely a business person, I am a professional, I am preparing for the board meetings, I am, I am that gal. And when I'm looking for this specific pair of shoes, I have an image in my mind of where I want to shop a black pump. When I am being this professional, um, I might be more of a, let's think of me as a working mom. I need to be able to go from being on my feet a lot all day long to running to the soccer game and not having those two black pumps stick into the dirt. I need to be versatile, but I also have a picture in my mind of where I'm going after these shoes. If I'm a marathon runner and I am in need of a pair of tennis shoes, I have a very specific need in mind and I have a very specific location that I want to shop at to get that need fulfilled. When we think of that in context of higher ed, if I am buying that little pair of black pumps or the tassel book or the tennis shoes, I don't want to have to go to a Macy's department store and sort my way through. Well, maybe I do want to, but I don't have time to, right? So I don't want to have to go to a big department store and shop my way through the menswear and the children's wear and the luggage and the other, you know, the bath towels and finally, finally, finally on the back side of the fourth floor to find the shoe department. When I know that what I want is a very specific evening MBA program or a very specific bachelor's degree completion program, what I want is to be able to go directly to the shoe store that sells my kind of shoes. And once I get there, I don't want it to look like the store on the left. I want it to look like the store on the right. I want that shoe to be displayed to me or that MBA program to be displayed to me 
in a neat and tidy fashion that is lovely in its display, that gets straight to the point of what do you have and what do you have to offer to me as a professional, and communicates very, very effectively without me having to go through either the giant department store maze or the crazy, overcrowded, often overpopulated content that we can occasionally find even on some microsites. So again, if you want to if you want to use that shoe shopping analogy, whether we like it or not in higher ed, people shop for education in a bit of a similar way. Now, of course, the threshold of buying is different and all of those sorts of things, but getting people directly to the shoe they are looking for quickly is half the battle. I will tell you personally, I'm a whole lot more likely to buy from the star on the right than the star on the left of your screen. So let's talk clear and concise path. And sorry, gentlemen, if none of you in the room are enjoying the shoe shopping analogy, I'm going to move on for it, from it. If we think about that clear and concise user path, and, and I just am trying to use this within the context of an example of an adult-focused microsite. What we have the opportunity to do is create, first and foremost, an immediate sense that you understand me as your consumer and my individual situation. So if you are able to, with a very skeptical eye, go out to your institutional website and just land on the main.edu homepage, when you sit and look at that as the adult professional that you are, what about that site speaks to you and says, hey, we're here for you? Probably very little. Not because you're not an important audience, not because the adult isn't an important contributor to the revenue stream of the institution, but because, again, we're trying to serve all people with that main institutional web page. At a microsite, you can speak directly to individual situations much more efficiently. We also know that it's a very specialized shop when you land at an adult-focused microsite, um, adult student-focused microsite, or, or a graduate student-focused microsite. It's a very limited number of pages and content, but it's all relevant to me. There is no sorting and shuffling through the three dozen pairs of shoes that I don't really think are, you know, business shoe worthy. It really truly is just all the content that I need in a very quick, concise presentation. The engagement that the, that the microsite would ask of me is all stuff that I care about. And I just tried to give some examples here of things that I have seen on institutional websites. We ask prospective students to engage with things on institutional websites all the time. But the sorts of things we ask them to engage with are things like move-in day videos. As an adult, I don't really care. <laughs> the highlights of the football game. Again, I really don't care. I'm not a football watcher. The sweet story of the 18-year-olds who are taking a trip to a foreign country. I'd really like to take the time to care about that sort of content, but quite honestly, I don't have the time. It's 11 o'clock at night. I just really want to understand whether or not you have my MBA program or my bachelor's degree completion program. So the engagement on a microsite can be truly relevant to a very specific audience, and that is really hard to do within the context of the larger website. We also know that specific adult-focused microsites get you to the content and only the content that you need quickly and the content that's going to get me to raise my hand and pull out that inquiry form. It's going to get me to say, yes, I want to talk to you as an institution. Tell me more. And as all of you know, for the adult student, it's usually about cost, convenience, flexibility, and career outcomes, and just that. It's not the ongoing story of and not to knock anything, this is all really important stuff, but it's not relevant when I'm shopping for a degree program. I don't really need to know about the liberal arts education. I don't need to know about the, you know, maybe the very diverse campus or the, you know, the opportunities that exist for $5 million in grants and scholarships that are being given out to the undergraduate students. It just really hones in quickly on the information that's going to help me to say, hey, wow, that's a good option for me. I'm going to go ahead and fill out your inquiry form. So the quickness, the speed with which you can move uh, directly to that inquiry within a microsite is better. I want you to ask yourself honestly here about updating the microsite because, or the website because I will also tell you one of the beauties of a microsite is that they're small enough that you actually can update them. And when I say update them, I don't mean change out the dates of the next open house or the next online um, 
webinar session about your institution, but really, truly change that at least 50% of the content within the context of your website. One of the hardest things about websites is they take forever to get done, and then once we finally get them done, we start to treat them like a brochure. Oh, thank goodness, that's done. I can ignore it now for the next year. And in reality, the more you refresh the content on the content on your website, the better you do from an SEO perspective. By having a microsite, you actually greatly increase your odds of being able to really get in there and based on good SEO practices, really update and add such content on a pretty regular basis. So um, if you already have a microsite, I'm going to push you to ask yourself when's the last time you really dramatically changed the content. If you don't have a microsite, part of the reason why you haven't changed the content, I'm probably almost certain, is because it feels like it's a huge and unwieldy process. When we think about developing user-specific content, we can think about a number of things on a microsite because we know there's one audience that's going to be looking at this. Not a multitude of audiences, but one audience. Number one, it can be written in a tone that's more adult-specific if you're looking at a specific adult student or graduate-focused microsite. We also know that it can be kept current and relevant. When all I'm trying to do is update content about what's going on in our adult student program or, or in our MBA program or our Masters of you know, Public Relations program, when I'm, when I'm specific to a single program or a specific audience like that, I can keep the content much more current and refresh content with what's new and what's going on much more readily. I can make sure it's meaningful to my audience. And I can also, when I write that content, optimize it so that it gets me good traction within search engines. We know refreshing content helps with SEO, but also making sure that it's optimized when it's written is really helpful as well, obviously. We know that academic programs within the context of a microsite have a little bit more leniency to be marketed in a very career-focused type of language rather than the often heavily academic language that we find on main institutional websites. So we can cut to the chase a little more quickly and keep it really, really relevant around some of the career-focused information, still allowing all of that heavy academic content to exist on our main website, but really cutting to the chase on the microsite. We can also really limit our copy. Um, just yesterday, I was at an institution. I picked up their Master's of Education brochure, and, and I shared this with them, so I'll share it with all of you. And literally, when I opened the front cover, my my eyes probably got quite wide, and, and what raised to my mind was, wow, this is a lot of words. We are guilty of that on the web, even though everyone you ask at every institution you'll ever spend time on will say, oh, web copy has to be tight, and it needs to be in bullets, and it needs to be short, and not in paragraphs. In reality, we do a whole lot of cutting and pasting out of our brochures onto our websites. And we might take out three words and feel like we've somehow tweaked it for the website. Keeping that copy tight, having the discipline to say no to copy is much more manageable within the context of a microsite as well. Addressing the key points. Microsites have the ability to address the key points and then stop. Um, so, so often we see um, schools get guilty of just going on and on. Oh, and there's this interesting fact about the program. Oh, and there's that interesting element of the program. And oh, did you know you could also perhaps do some of the courses online and some of them at a different campus, and we try to tell way too much of the story on the website. Your microsite, typically because it's managed by a smaller, tighter group that's more affiliated only with your specific audience, really has the ability to say no or to stop over communicating on the web. We did just a really quick, um, we have access to a number of institutes because we're working with them. We have access to a number of institutions and analytics. And part of what uh, Becky did for me in preparation for this webinar was take a look at those, we, I think, 11 different institutions, websites, and figure out where people are coming onto the websites. Part of this is to try to explain to you the benefits, that the SEO benefits that actually take place for microsites. The other part of this, though, is that I have had lots of conversations with vice presidents of marketing who worry that if we have an institutional microsite for the grad school, people will skip over their home page. What the data on your screen, I think, begins to show you is that people are skipping over your home page anyway. With the 11 institutions that we just did a quick blush look at um, internally, 
only 50% of those who came to the institution's broader site hit onto that homepage. Everybody else is diving in only to the content that they want. They're looking for that within, um, by doing Google searches to get to your site in the first place. So when you get the argument or you get the pushback from whether it's your VP of marketing or who knows, maybe it's your president who occasionally looks at your Google Analytics, you can hope, um, and says, no, 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 I want everyone to come into the front door of the home page. That's great if we control what our users do. But the truth is we don't. And users are going to come to us in whatever way that they want to. Um, just again, from this one quick point in time snapshot that we did of 11 schools, only half of folks were even coming in through the home page. Um, most people make their own path to you. When you have a well-optimized microsite, we increase the odds that what they get to when they type online MBA programs in Iowa is your microsite for the grad school that talks about that online MBA program, rather than, you know, online MBA programs in Iowa and instead, I accidentally end up on a page that just has a giant listing of the classes that I need to take. Is that helpful information? Yes. But does it really get me to take the action that I want, I as the institution want that consumer to take? It doesn't, because it doesn't encourage you to apply. It doesn't highlight our best benefits. Oddly enough, the list of classes is probably not that appealing, but sometimes is where a user ends up if by some chance that list happens to be well optimized by good luck. So when you think of the SEO benefits of having a microsite, think of it as casting a wider net. Because the content is targeted and because that domain authority is just bang on, spot on with the, with the specific audience, you can put compelling content within that. And then it's also shareable. And I'm going to show you some examples of this. But what you've really, in essence, created is a broader net than your institutional website can have it is going to be much more encompassing in relationship to um, those keywords and really being able to hone in on how people are searching. I'm going to show you a couple of institutional microsites. Um, by no means are we saying these are the gold standard or anything like that, but there are some elements on each of them that I want to show you that I think helps to point out some of the benefits to SEO, as well as to navigation and other things that we just can't see, or, or, or maybe this helps just to visibly bring it to light. Um, University of Northern Iowa's Continuing Education Department has this particular microsite that is fully optimized. The content and the written words on the page are, are bang on from an SEO perspective, but the beauty of this is that because it's a limited number of pages, all of the SEO stuff is, is well done. So all of the H1 tagging is done, all of the, um, all of the, back-end things that you don't see as the consumer are all taken care of to make sure that this site, when someone does continuing education in Iowa, that the University of Northern Iowa site does come up readily. A couple of other things about this that I just really like, it gets you straight to the information you're looking for very, very quickly. I love that this is obviously a grown-up <laughs> and obviously adult person is career-focused. I like that a lot. How can we help you as the institution? It's not so institutional-centric, but very consumer-centric. And look at the navigation. Four options, and that's it. Very tight. I mentioned earlier that um, athletics departments really um, mastered this earlier, or at least got their hands on it early. Um, while I'm sure a whole lot of folks come to the Michigan State Institutional website, there are also a lot of folks who just follow the Spartans and what they're really interested in, what were the results of the game scores last night, and those sorts of things. When you have a URL like msuspartans.com, you own that domain, and that domain authority gives you that boost in relationship to SEO that's so helpful. We also know that microsites have the opportunity to really do design and copy in a very flexible and compelling format. This is a great example from the Chicago School that really, I, I love this image. It, and what it really does is it allows for a level of flexibility that an institutional homepage could more than likely never have. Now, I'm sure somebody's going to send me an email that there's an institutional homepage that looks just like this, but there's probably not more than a dozen in the country. It, it really allows for this flexibility for both design and copy to reach out, <laughs> reach out and grab you, excuse the image, but reach out and grab you and pull you in very, very quickly. We also know that shareability is a big deal in relationship to SEO and how often your link to or shared is really relevant. 
and microsites have that ability in a very different way that broader institutional websites have. I'm going to keep moving along here. I promise time for uh, questions, and I'm knowing where I'm at in my presentation. I'm going to keep sliding along here, but please do type in your questions to Becky as the time goes on. The other thing that a microsite really allows for is to maximize your institution's online real estate. Institutional websites are really, really guilty of always adding another page. Oh, it's no big deal. We'll just add another page, which is true when you have thousands of pages. Because microsites require you to keep a much stronger level of discipline, you can really uh, trim and craft the content to only being the stuff that's most important and most relevant. We also know that the adult and graduate content on many institutional websites can tend to get a little bit lost or buried within the context of the main institutional site. Most schools have gotten pretty good pretty good about keeping the cost, convenience, flexibility, career outcomes stuff kind of grouped together for the adult and graduate students, but not all are great at it. And some still have the, if you click on cost, you end up jumping over to the financial aid information in the financial aid page, and, and it becomes that runaround, if you will, that, that can lose a consumer um, because they don't understand our process or our um, the way our institutions come together. So. Having things scattered all over, I think really, quite honestly, increases your odds of losing your prospective student dr dramatically. For adult and graduate students specifically, search is the number one way that they find out about colleges. You know, a 15-year-old, a 16-year-old, 17-year-old begins to develop a mental shortlist of the institution they want to attend. And, and typically, when they do their college search, they go straight, not all, but a lot, go straight in and look at a specific institution. For adult and graduate students, unless you are a more elite adult or graduate program in the country, and I mean really, you are elite, you're one of the Ivy Leagues or something like that, a lot of your consumers are going to do much broader searches, MBA online, and then they're going to see who shows up. When you do that MBA online piece, we know that that is the primary way that adult and grad students will look. By having a really honed microsite that's well optimized, you have the ability to show up aggressively there, even in highly competitive markets. I will also say that due to the smaller size, microsites give you the opportunity to develop the whole site with the idea of how can we plug analytics in and better understand what people are doing on this site. With institutional web pages, we just finished up doing an analytics training in California a couple of weeks ago, and one of the hardest things that we struggled with with the group and with the, the different audience members who were there from various institutions was that a lot of their pages really had no obvious actions that they wanted people to take. With a microsite, because it is a very limited number of pages, we can set that page up with the goal in mind of wanting to be able to measure how people interact with that page utilizing analytics. It can just be a much tighter picture. We know that a microsite functions as both a marketing and a recruitment tool. One of the hard things, I think, as you're contemplating on your campus whether or not you need an institutional microsite is that it's very possible that the conversation about this is actually being started out of the recruitment side of the house, not the marketing side of the house. Um, I've worked with a couple of marketing departments, in fact, who really just felt like it was an extra add-on. And the website certainly was comprehensive enough, and my goodness, it's 10,000 pages. It has everything in it that anyone could possibly want. What are you going to put on a microsite that's somehow going to add to that? Because it's also a recruitment tool, microsites are designed to help people take the next step on every single page, every single step along the way is totally designed with that mentality of how do I get them to give me their contact information so that I can begin the conversation with them. Our institutional websites make it far too easy for people to stealth shop. We do not actively encourage people as much as we could on institutional websites to take the step that we want them to. When we think of how folks arrive, the SEO piece of a well-designed microsite is what gets them to arrive there. The content is the marketing piece. That's what invites that conversation, gets them reading, gets them hooked, if you will, gets them engaged. And then the navigation and the clear calls to action, the clear goals on the page, what do we want them to do is what helps move them into the funnel. 
Think about the amount of traffic that you get on your institutional website pages for graduate school or adult programs or even alumni or donor where people have been on your site but did nothing. They looked around, they found information, and then they snuck back off your site with you having no information about them. Getting them to those clear calls to action, getting them to engage with you is what it's really all about within the context of a microsite. I think of microsites as being the first recruiter for an adult and graduate student that that, that student is going to interact with. How well that microsite engaged me and got me, quote unquote, talking to the institution is really what it's all about. One of the hardest parts, I think, when we talk about designing a microsite is people become fearful right out of the gate because of the enormous timeline. And most of our thinking is based on the experience we've had in trying to redesign main institutional websites. So a couple of points about main institutional websites here, which are which are a difficult, difficult task to undertake. Don't, don't get me wrong. Um, they're large, they're unwieldy, and there's a whole lot of hands involved in, and a whole lot of politics involved in institutional websites. But as a result, most institutional websites take from nine months, if you're super speedy, to two years to redesign. They are, they are enormous, and they take a lot of time and a lot of conversation. And I think when most people start to think microsite, they think, oh my gosh, I cannot take on that level of a project for a year or two years. And that's an unwarranted fear, but it's what people think of. We also know that most institutional websites are thousands of pages. So when people think microsite, they think, oh my gosh, all that work. In reality, a different picture for microsites. We know that institutional websites are really overburdened with a lot of content that many, many people never access. Um, and every institution I've ever done a website redesign with intends to trim their number of pages when they start, and most do. So if I start with 5,000 pages, I very successfully get it down to 3,500. But in reality, 3,500 is still a whole lot of content that probably doesn't need to be there, but quite honestly, we got tired of talking about it. It was holding the whole process hostage, um, trying to sort through the pages and decide what didn't need to be moved over to the new site, was holding up the whole process of launching the new site. And so eventually, towards the end, that last thousand pages just gets slid because we get exhausted of the process. We also know, again, that institutional sites are very guilty of trying to be all things to all people, which to some degree, maybe that's what they need to be. But then there also needs to be that back end for the person who's only shopping for a pair of good tennis shoes. What's the, sh what's the tennis shoe store that exists when you're faced with going to Macy's and you really only need a pair of tennis shoes? Institutional websites, just due to their um, foundation and where they came from, are really seen as a way, hopefully, to communicate information and market to people Hopefully, we are to that point. It's not just seen as an information hub, but it's really a marketing tool. But we often forget that it's also a recruitment tool. And so when it's designed and built, it's not built with recruitment in mind or giving in mind, if you're on the um, alumni or um, advancement side of the shop, but really with communicating and beginning the conversation. Because of our highly competitive market for both donated dollars as well as enrolled students, today we need our websites to take us the next step further. We can't just give information. We just can't invite a conversation and hope that somebody follows up on it. We really have to aggressively say, no, stay, talk to me more now, engage with me more now. And, and main institutional websites struggle with that. When you think of a microsite, you have an opportunity just to get correct or get around some of those larger issues that will always, by their nature, exist within those giant .edu sites. First and foremost, a microsite can be completed in four to six months. Um, in reality, if you're really super fast, you can probably get them done in three months. But really, within an academic year, within half an academic year, you can pull off completing a microsite and get it live and get it working for you. We also know that microsites typically, because of their smaller size, is part of that uh, speed to completion. Depending upon how complex, your department is, if you're a continuing ed microsite, you might have a slightly broader reach than if you're purely a business school microsite um, or a business MBA program microsite. 
typically less than 100 pages, and I will tell you very honestly, we see a lot that are less than 50 pages. And when you think about updating content and saying 50 pages feels manageable. 50 pages scattered all over a 3,500 page site feels a lot less manageable. They're all very audience specific, so that content is going to be really speaking only to one audience and that audience that you're interested in reaching. You also, because the content is tighter, have the ability to go through that site with a fine tooth comb and making sure that the writing is optimized and really benefiting your SEO, but also all the other elements that are on the back side of those pages that we don't see really are in good shape as well. We know that microsites tend to get better maintained than large institutional websites. Again, usually it's a smaller group of people ultimately responsible for them. And let's just be really honest, if I am recruiting for the adult side of the house and I view this as a key recruitment tool for me, I'm going to work hard to make sure that everything about that tool is working at the maximum ability that it can. So I'm just really going to be on it and stay with it much more aggressively. So again, to go back to the shoe store analogy, when our busy adult or graduate students come looking for a pair of shoes, what does our shoe store look like? Is it the crazy mess that I showed you on the left side of the screen of where, yes, it's only a shoe store, so yes, we have a microsite, but it's kind of wild, wild west, or is it that neat, tidy presentation, or is it Macy's, and where are you at, and how are you inviting them to engage on that microsite? We have a lot of schools that ask us, how do we decide if we even need an institutional uh, or a microsite at our institution? How do we even assess what we have on our current website to see if we're good candidates for this or if it would make sense for us? So I do want to talk you through a web assessment process just really quickly, and then we're going to move to questions. Um, because I do think it's worth the investment for an institution to help them to make a good decision. So a good web assessment is going to take a look at how your main institutional brand interacts with the sub-brands that may be out there on microsites or just may exist in different departments. We're going to take a look at how the integration is with the main site in relationship to optimal user experience. We're also going to do a competitor analysis of other competitors' websites. You need to be better than your primary competitors, not as good as or, oh, we have something similar to but we need to see how we stack up and then make sure that we're giving you an advantage here. If you operate on the adult and grad side of the house, your microsite or your website is your only chance to get in front of these folks. More than likely, they're not going to engage with you before they've been to your website. So this is really, really critical. We're going to take a look at user experience by target audience, information architecture, which we know is a huge element of this. Can they find anything they're looking for? We're going to take a look at both the text as well as the graphics and how it connects back to your key audiences. We're going to take a look at best practices. Um, best practices in digital change daily, practically. And so really making sure that your site both holds appeal as well as following best practices. There's some really neat things you find out on websites that just fly in the face of all good best practice. And, and tightening those two and having them work together in sync is really important. Obviously, an analysis of your SEO and what you need to do to tighten that up is going to be a piece of that, as well as on-page optimization assessment for your specific pages for your audiences. Obviously, are you meeting compliance for web standards? And then the analytics, rec making recommendations for additional setup, and then reporting. Web analytics, everyone has. I'm, I'm yet to find a school that doesn't tell me they already have analytics set up on their site. What I say all the time is most of them are standing about ankle deep on the shallow end of a swimming pool. And what you really need to be able to do is say, how do we wade into the waters a bit more deeply to really understand and set up things within the context of our analytics to have them make sense and really benefit us as an institution. The investment in a microsite, I am going to first ask you to ask yourself this question. How much money are you spending right now driving people to your main.edu site? Most institutions' marketing buckets for enrollment drives people to their main institutional site. What's the risk when they get there and can't find what they're looking for? Sorry for the jumping around here. I'm not sure what happened on this slide. How many of your adults or graduate students do you think come to your institutional site and then you lose because they can't find what they're looking for? Folks, if it's more than two, you've just paid for a microsite by enrolling two more students. 
it truly, it, if you break it down that way, it really is a pretty obvious investment of time and money. At what rate do your website leads convert? What if you could get 10 more website leads a year? How many more students would that turn out to be from an enrolled perspective? I would anticipate that saying you'll only get 10 more leads a year with a microsite is a very, very, very conservative estimate. I would say it'd be much higher than that. But again, let's be realistic and conservative here. And then lastly, how much enrollment revenue are you leaving on the table because you don't have a microsite tool in place, because you aren't aggressively moving people to the point of having them give you their information, of having them engage with you in a way that's meaningful and really allows you to continue that conversation on a regular basis. Okay, last slide and then we're gonna go to questions. Um, a couple of things to, to just think about as we wrap up um, this portion of the webinar, the content portion, and move to the question. Audience-specific microsites are becoming the norm. If you are sitting in your office or wherever right now thinking, well, we don't have an audience-specific microsite, I'm gonna tell you you will within the next five years. Um, very much like a few years ago, everyone said, well, do we need to have a responsive website? Today, websites don't get designed that aren't responsive. This is really the wave of the future because we've realized that our audience now drives the content that they want to view, and they want it all bucketed up into a nice spot. Um, again, like I said, you will, and part of why you will is because of how important revenue has become to colleges and universities across the country. Very few institutions in the country right now are in such a comfortable financial position that they're not asking for more enrollment, specifically out of their adult and grad side of the shop. As that becomes more and more the norm, this is another tool that can help you to get there. And then, of course, the ability to measure ROI on microsites is tremendous because they are specifically set up with that in mind. They're set up with the end game in mind, which is just dramatically different um, context than what the main institutional site is set up with. Okay, I promise time for questions and answers, and I think uh, Becky is going to join me on the phone and see if we have some Q&A. We have about uh, 10 minutes or so to try to handle questions. So uh, Becky, do you have any questions that have been typed in over the course of the webinar? Yeah, actually we've got a couple. Um, the first one is, how would you differentiate between landing pages and microsites? Becky, I'm sorry, can you say that again with just a little bit slower? Oh yeah, absolutely. How would you differentiate between landing pages and microsites? Sure, so, sure. Um, Becky, I'm, actually I'm gonna invite you to give a little answer for that as well, but let me start and then I'll kick it over to you. So a microsite, think of it as a series of, or a bucket of content that's all one specific, or specific towards a single audience. A landing page is, um, with any luck, a place where someone is going to land or arrive where really there's only one thing for them to do, that it's the clear, we see landing pages most often connected to paid media. And the landing page says, here's a couple of interesting points, and by the way, we want your information. And that's the only thing that we try to do on a landing page. A microsite really does allow the consumer to do a little bit of looking around. I'm gonna be able to find out about costs. I'm gonna be able to find out information about flexibility of the program and that sort of thing. But it's it's a little bit broader than that landing page setup. And Becky, did you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, like Brenda said, microsites, really you're intending on getting people there more than one way. Um, the, the landing pages that we work with, typically they're really, really tied to a campaign. So whether that campaign is like Brenda mentioned with the paid media, um, sometimes it's for a specific email campaign that we're working on, but basically you, you created that page to drive very specific audience to do a very specific thing. Um, microsites are sort of one level up on the specificity of the content. So you, you want people to get there from a lot of different ways. Organic search, maybe you've got links um, back and forth between your main website, those sorts of things. So um, a, little bit, a little bit broader, but obviously much more specific than the main website. Great. Becky, is there another question? Oh yeah, we're getting a couple more in here. Um, okay. The next one. Uh, can you explain more regarding the integration with the main site? As in, when users get to the microsite through online search, is there a link to the main website? Sure, absolutely. I, I think, I would say yes. And I would say, though, that every individual institution makes a different determination on that. But I think you always want to give your user the opportunity 
to get back to the main institutional website. I think the, di the difference here is that you don't want to get, well, think of it like backing down an, or driving down an alley and then having to back their way back out, right? The last thing in the world you want to do is back, drive down that alley and then be like, oh, whoops, I meant to be back on the street back there, and now I'm going to have to, you know, risk my life by trying to back back out of it. You always want your consumer within the contents of your microsite to be able to jump back to the main site if they want to. But again, it's not the main goal of them being there to go to back to the main site. I'll also say from an integration perspective, I think there's a really important aspect. Um, remember on that website assessment we talked about that the brand of the institution and the brand that's within the context of the microsite need to flow fairly seamlessly back and forth. You do not want a consumer to feel like they have jumped off the Brenda Harms.edu site and gone on to the Becky Vardaman.edu site. Um, <laughs> you want there to still be that consistency between so they understand they're still looking at one institution. What you've really done is you've created a room that's just all about them. Becky, was there anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, actually, in fact, there was a follow-up um, to that question. I apologize. I'm juggling the different chats here, trying to read these things as we're talking. So the follow-up is, um, wouldn't the search results show both the regular page and the microsite page? And I, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, the whole idea of having this really optimized content is that Hopefully, yeah, they might be on the same page if you're searching for like the overall big brand name of the institution. But but the idea is that on those targeted searches, the ones that are most likely to convert, somebody looking for one specific program or whatever that microsite is specifically about, um, you're going to rank higher, you're going to rank better, and you're going to rank where your normal um, overall institution wouldn't have as much teeth and ability to get on that that first page. So yeah, there is a possibility, but the idea is that it's going to be a better one. <laughs> And Becky, just to kind of add a layer on to that, and you know, let's just be really realistic here. Most institutional have institutions have tremendous good intent on being well optimized. And what most institutions tell me is, oh, absolutely, we have great SEO. We had it all done when we designed our website, which was two years ago. The algorithm that focuses on search engine optimization and really gives you that ranking changes constantly. So unless you are really maintaining that on a regular basis, which most institutional-wide sites just have no ability to do, you're ranking on a microsite. You can never say never, but will almost always rank much more highly than your main institutional website would. Excellent. Um, hold on one second as I'm reading. Sorry. <laughs> How about Hard to do both at once. Here's one. Um, our microsite is created outside the CMS that is used for the entire institutional site. Oh, Becky, it's a CMS related question. Can I let you answer that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. And the answer is um, it, it depends on how you want to do it. You can. You can absolutely create it within the same CMS. Um, it's basically like creating a whole new website, though. So, like, I we use the same CMS for uh, several different uh, domains that we have, but our developers created them and kind of built them in their own buckets within the CMS. So it, it's up to you on how you want to do that from a technical standpoint, whether you want to use it or not. But the thing to keep in mind that it is, it's actually a different website. It's going to be a different environment, even if it is within that CMS. Um, here's one. Do you have any advice or opinion of microsites that ask for a login? For example, someone has to register to access the microsite, and um, then they are entered in a customer management tool for more follow-up. Does this irritate site visitors, or do they generally mind? I will say just say no. <laughs> um, my view on that is anytime you create a barrier to people getting into your microsite, you've defeated the purpose of the microsite. Because guess what? There's 15 other schools that don't have that, and I'm just going to go with one of those. Um, I understand that the goal is because I want to capture your information, because I want to reach out to you, but how many people do you turn away who get a little weirded out and think it's creepy that you're asking them to log in to get to your microsite? So I am absolutely not, unless you've got something on that microsite that's top secret, I would absolutely not be a fan of people needing to log in to get to the microsite. It's kind of like having to log in as a current student. That makes sense because they have access to different types of information. But to just get into the information on a microsite, I think you're hurting yourself far more than you're helping yourself. Excellent. 
Um, here's one, Brenda. How do we address the possibility of having multiple grants with various microsites throughout the same institution? Great question. And that's where I think it's so critical. Remember early on in this webinar, I said that marketing and recruitment really need to have a very tight relationship, that hand-holding, maybe not engaged, but heavily dating sort of relationship. I think it's dangerous when we see microsites being developed outside of the institutional brand without, just outside of the institutional brand, period. I think the goal here is always how do we bring those audiences together, understanding that it's very possible that recruitment's probably driving the desire for the microsites, but it's still going to be important to play nice, if you will, in the sandbox with the marketing folks. So a dramatically different brand, I think, is a, is a big risk and, and not something that I would encourage. I think the goal here is how do, we, how do we work well together with the marketing department to make sure that we have enough consistency of brand. And it might be a thin, remember, brand is who you are, the core of who you are. It's not as much a tagline or those sorts of things. But there are some elements of consistency about who you are as an institution that really do fold between the adult and grad side of the shop and the traditional side of the shop. And so it's about how do we bring that to life within the context of the microsite. Good question. Yeah, very right. good. Becky, okay, I think we have time for about one more, and then we're going to get our hour. Our. Okay, great. Um, uh, how about this one? Our expectation is that there will be more stealth shoppers that will never fill out the inquiry forms or just go straight to the application. How do you know if your website is being successful in this scenario? <sighs> well, that wasn't an easy good last question. <laughs> um, it, it is a great, okay, so, so long and short is no matter how much we want to control what other people do, we'll never get it perfect. What you do have the opportunity, however, to do is within your analytics to set up properly different goals so that you know if they are doing some of the behaviors that you would like them to do. Um, I know one of the um, analytics goals that Becky recently has set up on the site is how many pages they interacted with because they're not filling out that inquiry form like we'd like them to, but we know that they spent time on four pages within the context of our microsite. So we are marking that as a goal accomplished. Did we get their contact information? Not necessarily. But do we know that they did part of what we wanted them to do within the context of our website? I will tell you, for large institutional websites, that's harder than it is for microsites. Again, everything just becomes a little bit neater as you trim it down into a microsite-related bucket. So that kind of narrows, narrows things a bit. And, and that's a great question. There will be more and more self shoppers. But I will also say part of why there's a lot of self shopping is because most websites aren't set up well to get them to take any action other than inquire or start the app. And there should be other things for people to do on your website and are on your microsite. And that's, I think, part of the goal of the microsite. Okay, I'm getting the flag that we are just to 2 o'clock. So I am going to um, wrap this up. Please don't disconnect yet. A couple of things. Once we do wrap the webinar up, we are going to send out a survey at the end. And it's really important to us that you fill that survey out. It helps to make us better and um, helps us to provide better webinars in the future. So please, please, please fill out the survey. Becky is also going to be sending out the webinar uh, to those of you who participated, so that will be available. It's also available on our website for download, and that's convergeconsulting.org. I've also included here, just on this last slide, if you're interested in continuing the discussion about microsites or have further questions or we weren't able to get to these questions today, please don't hesitate to either email me or give me a phone call. Um, I, I think microsites are going to become more and more the norm. So as you are considering them at your institution, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or, or to us um, as a company. We, we really enjoy the conversation with schools about how to make their conversion better in relationship to digital media. So I want to thank you again for joining us for this webinar. I hope that you enjoyed it and were able to take a few good nuggets from it. And I uh, look forward to talking with you more in the future. Thanks, everyone, and have a great afternoon.